thank you so much uh, for for this introduction. And yeah, uh, this is uh, Elise Bick presenting from San Francisco, where it's already evening. Uh, I just came back from the Netherlands, so I'm sort of uh, living on two continents, it feels like. But uh, today I'm in San Francisco. So um, as you already heard, I'm sort of, um, I have a background in microbiology and I actually started a couple of years ago, a website or a blog called Microbiome Digest. And I do want to specifically mention, so it's, it's currently run by volunteer. I've started it and I ran it for, I think, five years by myself. But um, as I was switching more and more to science integrity work, I couldn't combine all those things at the same time. So I do want to mention Svetlana Pirovic who, and Axel Kunschner, who are uh, the, the, the main volunteers running the, the website currently. So there we try to gather the latest papers on microbiome. So uh, if you are interested in that, and I, <laughs> I assume all of you are, I uh, would like to uh, give a little plug for that website. And uh, we could always use more volunteers because... Um, a lot of volunteers sign up and then they don't show up <laughs> later. So I think that's a problem everywhere where you um, are depending on volunteers. So um, I also run a blog called Science Integrity Digest, which is sort of my current focus. I've switched to science integrity work. And you can also find me on Twitter. My handle is Microbiome Digest without the E, uh, just because uh, I Twitter didn't offer me all the letters that I wanted, but uh, it's Microbiome Digest. So with that, I also want to disclose, give my disclosures um, because um, I, I criticize other people's papers. And so I need to make sure that I um, fully disclose how I make my money. I am not uh, employed by a university. I uh, am a consultant, so I'm sort of self-employed. And I get income by giving consulting um, advice to universities or publishers for science integrity cases. And I also give talks at universities and for publishers. And I'm also in the, the ethical committee for eLife, which is a journal. And so I uh, get some income through that. Most of my income currently comes through patreon.com, which is a website where people can uh, donate small amounts of money. I don't say this to ask for money, but this is my current, uh, my main source of income. And I'm very grateful for the people who allow me to work on the cases I want to work at. I also have worked at a company called Ubiome. We made microbiome kits for uh, customers. But unfortunately, the founders have been charged with insurance fraud and the company was raided by the FBI. But only the founders are uh, have been found uh, to be guilty of that and are charged. They're currently fugitives also. So there's a you know, I, I hope there will be a movie about this company, but I have worked there and uh, I've left the company before all of this, uh, these charges were filed and before the FBI did their raid, uh, I had already left the company, but uh, because of many other concerns I had. Uh, but yeah, I need to take full responsibility that I work there. I also want to thank a lot of other people who do similar work as I do, uh, all of us, uh, in one way or another, work on post-publication peer review. We, we um, look at images and other problems found in papers after they have been published. And uh, the, one, the, the names here in bold are the ones who work on images, but other people work on plagiarism, uh, statistical concerns, ethical concerns, or, or provide the platforms that we use to uh, raise those concerns on. So why do all of us care about this? We care about science because for us, science is about finding the truth and publications are the way that we scientists talk to each other. So when we publish something, we uh, hope that other people will cite our work. And of course, when we start our research, we look at what other people have published. So publications are the building blocks of science. This is how we communicate with each other. And we layer new layers of bricks, new layers of publications. We build on each other's work. So if one of those publications contains just an error or fraud, that means that other people cannot replicate that work, that, the, that those bricks are not on stable ground. And part of the wall, uh, part of uh, a theory, for example, in, in science could tumble down. Uh, now, of course, as scientists, we tend to trust each other. 
but we sometimes might be a little bit too naive because there is fraud in science. And of course, it's a small percentage, but I'll be talking about that today. And so, um, uh, but I do want to point out, I'm focusing on the, the bad apples in the fruit basket of science, but there is, uh, there's also a lot of good science, obviously. I'm just focusing on a couple of bad cases. Now, a science misconduct is defined in the United States and many other countries as one of three things. Plagiarism, which is um, copying somebody else's text or ideas without giving credit. Falsification is where a person does an experiment but changes a value. For example, uh, changes a value so it becomes from a negative a positive. That is falsification. And fabrication is where a person completely makes up results. So just types in some numbers in a spreadsheet and makes a beautiful graph without actually going into the lab and doing a measurement. Now, why do people cheat in science? Because I don't think anybody starts their career in science by thinking, oh, let's, let's do some fraud. Well, all of us feel the pressure to publish. And, and of course, it's easier to publish positive results than negative results. And so when your results are negative, you could sort of see that a person might be tempted to change the results so it looks better. And also, uh, yeah, we just feel that pressure. But in some countries, there's very strict rules on how many papers one should publish, for example, while doing a master's degree or while doing a PhD or finishing medical school, you have to publish a scientific paper. Uh, and in some cases, these are nearly impossible requirements. Because as an early career scientist or as a medical doctor, we might not just have uh, time to do a good quality research. We're either still learning it or we're focusing on clinical care. So sometimes impossible requirements will lead people to cheat in certain countries, not because certain countries, um, you know, people are more fraudulent. It's because of impossible requirements by governments or by um, research institutions to, to publish. Now, there's also specific scenarios. So I can think of a person who was very successful early in their career, maybe a postdoc or even a PhD, got a nature publication or won a big award. But when they become a professor and they shift research fields, their, their um, results are not that beautiful, but they, they have tasted success and they sort of might be tempted to cheat. And then finally, um, there's... Of course, a very uh, you're so dependent as an early career scientist on your professor, on the lab where you work, that if that person in power, that uh, leader of the lab or that professor is a bully or is very demanding and maybe says, uh, I want this result to look like that. I want this result by Friday. Otherwise, I will fire you. That might be a big uh, temptation to cheat, not because the person wants to cheat, but because they care about their own career and they're so dependent on this bully. So I'm saying all these scenarios because I realize that there are very sad uh, cases behind the scenes in each of these cases. So this is one of the main reasons I don't try to focus too much on the people who, um, especially if they're the first author, because I feel that the first author, which is usually the junior person in a lab, they might not really cheat, want to cheat themselves, but they might be forced because there's a very bad atmosphere in the lab. So I'll make it about mainly about the images and not about the persons. We might not know is, who is really responsible. Now, when you think about figures in scientific papers, they might look like, like some of these. And of course, microbiome papers, uh, at least the ones I've published and I'm familiar with, will mainly have line graphs. They will have ordination plots or heat maps or bar graphs. Um, and those are actually very easy to cheat. We would not really know um, if these results are real, but I can tell you these graphs are my own, so they are really real. But uh, you know, anybody could draw these things in an Excel spreadsheet and make them look believable um, without actually doing an experiment. So that's a very scary thought. But I mainly look at photos because photos are a little bit easier to spot duplications or, or manipulations in. All of these photos are fine, by the way, but I'm just showing them because photo, we can tell these things apart. We can tell the mice apart. We can tell tissues apart or bands in a Western blot or in a DNA uh, gel. 
we can tell all of these lanes apart um, because they all look slightly different. But of course, there's also cases where you might find image duplication, uh, in this case, inappropriate image duplication. And this is what I specialize in. So I'm showing these examples. These are uh, cases where there's duplicated images within, in this case, within the same figure, but they can also be uh, within between different figures in the same paper or even across two different papers. So there are several types of duplications and uh, all of these are inappropriate because in all of these cases, the duplications uh, that are marked here with colored boxes are, uh, are supposed to represent different experiments. So here are bacteria streaked on plates, um, whether they grow or not. And you can see that in this case, these two uh, panels marked by me with red boxes, but also these two panels marked with blue boxes look identical. And this is a simple duplication. It's the exact same photo used twice to represent different experiments. Uh, I removed the labels here, but they, they were all supposed to be different mutations and different growth conditions. Um, so uh, here in the middle is an example of a repositioned duplication showing four different panels. Uh, show, uh, each uh, represents cells being treated with different amount of radiation, but two of these panels here overlap and these two panels also overlapped and I've marked these with colored boxes. So here is a case where uh, instead of looking at four samples that we for independent experiments, we're looking at at best only two. I think I think what happened here is that uh, the sample, you know, was, was there was a photograph taken, but then the, the sample was moved a little bit under the microscope. And whether or not that is cheating, uh, I don't really know, uh, but it I, I think in this case it was, but we're, we're not quite sure yet. The simple duplications are probably errors. Uh, it's not necessarily misconduct, but the repositioned one mm, is a little bit more likely to have been done intentionally. And these duplications here on the right are duplications in this case uh, within a photo. So here you see Western blot where two panels, two lanes um, are duplicated, lane one, and three in panel A uh, look the same, while in panel D, three lanes look the same. Now that's very likely to have been done intentionally. That looks like this was really, I feel this category three and sometimes category two are very likely um, uh, to, to have been done intentionally. And you can find these examples sometimes also in graphs. So here's an example of a type one duplication here are cells being treated with different compounds. Um, doesn't really matter. One is A112 and one is tamibarotin. And um, you can see that uh, according to the label, these should all be uh, eight different photos. But the two here at the, at the top and these two here at the bottom graphs look identical. There's some maybe discoloration, some, but, but like it's the same point of view. So this is a type one duplication. I do believe this was an accident. Um, maybe they prepared the photo and just didn't didn't uh, include the last photo uh, correctly. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, yeah, I reported this to the journal in October 2015 and the journal never took any action. I feel this could have been addressed with a correction, but it wasn't. Here's a duplication with a repositioning. Here are um, Enterobacter Sakazaki um, used to treat different cells, uh, doesn't really matter, but you can see that several panels marked in uh, by green or by red boxes overlap with each other. So this is a type two duplication. The sample was moved under the microscope a little bit. And there were some other problems in this paper as well. And this paper got retracted um, and um, after, but it took three years to uh, almost three, more than three years to get it retracted. Um, and with the other problems, I do think that was a good outcome. Um, here's a type two duplication. This is actually a microbiome paper. So I tried to put in some, some examples that you might even have read this paper. So this is uh, published in Science Advances. And here's our cases. Um, these are gut microbiome treated with the probiotics. I'm not quite sure what, what this particular experiment was, but to me, it looked like these four mice look very similar to these four mice. But the, the, the signal that was picked up by some measurement um, 
looks looks different. Like these have more red here and these have fewer red, but it seems to be the same mice. So I don't know what happened there. And there were other cases where in this case, uh, two differently treated um, experiments um, overlapped here shown with uh, the red boxes are part of the, the original image, but the yellow boxes are mine and the green boxes also, and there's overlap. And, and while they said, oh, there's fewer, I don't know, red cells here than in this one, but they, they appear to pick different corners to maybe have that result. So I felt this was done on purpose, but of course it's hard to really know that. And in this case, the paper got corrected uh, within a couple of months, pretty fast. And then here's a duplication with um, duplicated elements within the same photo. These are fungal spores. And here you can see that several spores in panel B and even more spores in panel D have been duplicated. I feel this is intentionally done. I mean, this doesn't happen by accident, but the journal allowed for a correction. I was a bit disappointed by that. And uh, duplications can also happen sometimes in plots. So this is uh, not flow cytometry. I call this flaw cytometry because this seems to be very flawed. Uh, I mean, I cannot imagine this happening by accident. A lot of, lot of duplications here between these three panels. And I reported this uh, online, but the journal did not take any action. So this paper is still out there. So I, I scanned a lot of papers um, to look for these specific image duplications. And I found in a set of 20,000, which I scanned by eye, I found 800 papers with duplicated figures. So that's about 4% of these papers that contain these images that had been duplicated. I did focus only on papers that had photos. If they didn't have a photo, I didn't count them. And my two co-authors, Arturo Casadeval, who is the editor-in-chief of Mbio, and Farrakh Fang, the editor-in-chief of Infection and Immunity at that time, uh, they uh, helped me and they had to both agree with my findings. We, uh, of, the, of the 800, so the 4%, we estimated that about half of them had been done intentionally. So uh, about 2% of this set of papers appeared to contain misconduct, uh, visible misconduct. But of course, misconduct in any other type of data would be much harder to detect. I, you know, if people could be very good Photoshoppers or people could move the sample a little bit farther under the microscope, so I would not find an overlap. Or people could just type in some numbers and make a spreadsheet or make a, a heat map or an ordination plot without doing the without actually having measured any samples. So alteration in any other data type that is not a photo is much harder to detect, and the percentage of misconduct might be much higher than two percent. Um, I'm gonna skip because I'm, we're running already a little bit over time. Uh, journals, unfortunately, are very slow to respond. So of the 700 papers, uh, 800 papers, two thirds had, there was no action taken, taken after waiting five years. So that's very disappointing that journals do not seem to respond for various reasons. And we can discuss that later in the, in the Q and A. So officially you should report these cases to the editor in chief of the journal. Um, or to the research integrity officer of the university where the the misconduct was uh, was done. Uh, and you usually should keep it very objective. Don't accuse anybody of misconduct. You should just say, well, you know, figure 2B looks very much like figure 3C. And uh, well, but unfortunately, in many cases, there's no action taken. And so I'm starting to post, or I have started a long time ago, to post these concerns on puppeer.com. And I recommend that you uh, install uh, Puppier's plugin that works with many browsers and it also works with Zotero. So you can see which papers have um, a Puppier command. So if you do a PubMed search and you have the Puppier plugin installed, you will see these green banners and then you can click on it and you go to the paper on Puppier with the concerns or any other co comment um, highlighted. So it's a very useful way to check if papers might have concerns. Because we, uh, you know, all the people I mentioned on one of the first slides, we try to post as many as we can papers. So to warn you, because I feel that the journals are not taking a lot of action as well. Um, 
so of course with COVID-19, we have seen many cases of suspected misconduct and misinformation. We've seen a lot of vaccine misinformation. We've seen papers claiming that hydroxychloroquine would work. We've seen papers claiming hydroxychloroquine would not work based on a falsified data set. So that paper got retracted. But unfortunately, the paper that uh, claimed that hydroxychloroquine did work was, um, was flawed, but was not retracted. And I, um, I, I posted a long blog post and many comments on that paper because um, there were just a lot of concerns. For example, the people who died on, uh, who were treated with hydroxychloroquine were not uh, were taken out of the study. And that is misconduct, right? You leave out the results you don't want. That's not good. But also it was later discovered that, well, it was already known that the people who were not treated, so here in black, the people who were not, um, uh, who, who remained pos positive, that those people uh, were in a different hospital in Nice um, than the people who were being treated in Marseille. But it then later it came out in a, in a like last year in uh, several articles in which people who worked at the institution the, uh, in Marseille were interviewed and they said, well, we had to use different uh, uh, threshold values. So the people in Nice, we used um, a, a very high threshold value. So if they had 39 cycles, then um, we, uh, we still call them uh, positive or so. So um, for example, so because of these different thresholds, uh, a person with a value of 37 PCR cycles was declared negative in Marseille, but positive in Nice. So if you use two different cutoffs in your study, then of course you're gonna make your results look better because here it looks like these people in Marseille were already um, were uh, already negative while they might've been positive if the same threshold was, uh, was included. So there's all kinds of ways to, to cheat with this data. And it appeared that this particular lab uh, has a history of, of either cutting corners or not, but they have done a lot of work on the microbiome as well. And they have like uh, papers like this, here's a duplication. And I think this one is a particular, it's just an error, but uh, you know, figure one and figure two look to me pretty much the same. So this is maybe just an error by the journal. I, I'm not quite sure what happened here, but I also found uh, papers by this particular group where parts of the plots and blots and photos have been duplicated. So here's an example where I think it looks like this image has been photoshopped. And unfortunately, this has not been addressed yet. I reported this to the journal uh, pretty recently, but I'm not quite sure if this will be investigated. And I found other, other problems in this study as well. There were um, many papers in which this lab um, described new bacteria found in the gut microbiome of people in African countries. And um, in many cases, these papers had some vague wording about uh, approval of an ethical committee in France, but not in one of the rep republics or countries where these samples have been obtained. So there was a whole set of papers, and I commented on each of these on papier, a set of papers from pygmy people who uh, who, yeah, where stool samples were taken and novel bacterium were isolated without any description on how these people live and without any clarity on whether or not they gave consent um, in their own language. And, um, and there were also no co-authors from these countries either, which you could say is neo-colonial -col science or helicopter science. And so there were many things wrong, I think, with these papers, both ethical as well as uh, in terms of authorship. And yeah, I, I, I feel this is wrong. And I, I commented to all of these papers. But of course, the, the leader of the lab did not quite appreciate that. And I can, I can see that. I can see that criticism is not, not fun to receive. But instead of answering these questions and taking away my concerns, he actually um, claimed that he filed a complaint against me and he threatened me with a lawsuit. And luckily, a lot of people, um, other scientists, uh, started petitions and signed those petitions because this is sort of a chilling effect. Like, the, you know, he was trying to silence me by making videos about me and, and uh, complaining about me online. 
And so the, there's no lawsuit yet, but it's a big threat that hangs over my head. And I know that this work could financially ruin me because I might be right, but you know, if the other person is richer and has a better lawyer, I still need to pay a lot of money trying to defend myself. But I feel that these discussions should not be held in the courtroom. They should be held by, between scientists. And, and in this case, that did not happen. Um, finally, we can uh, use uh, AI um, to spot these duplications. I've done most of them by, by eye, but we can use AI, <laughs> artificial intelligence, to, to make software to find these things. And I'm starting to use, I've, I'm, I'm using Image Twin and, and some of these uh, other tools as well. And, and that's great. And that can find a lot of these problems. But unfortunately, artificial intelligence can also create fake images. You know, go to thispersondoesn'texist.com. It cr will create a new face every time that is not a face of a real person. It's just made up. Or you can use Dell E, which is the, the latest hit, um, where you can just type in something and it will generate a photo. And these photos are unique. You cannot spot any duplications in them. So I am a bit uh, worried about the future of science if we can use AI to create fake papers. How can we detect that? So this is my last slide. I've um, uh, touched a bit of, about how we can prevent misconduct and I didn't mention everything, but we can use for things like open science, good research practices to prevent misconduct. Uh, it's going to make it harder to cheat, but it's not going to completely prevent it. <coughs> Excuse me. We should also focus less on measuring our productivity, but just looking at our publications or impact factor. And we should also focus more on ways to publish negative outcomes because those are as valuable as positive outcomes. Uh, there should be fewer or less conflict of interest amongst publishers or in institutions. They seem to be not really willing to investigate these cases, even though they make lots of money, uh, you know, either through the open access model or through the paywalled access. Uh, but they don't seem to care a lot, publishers, uh, about, about quality control or about customer care, because, you know, we complain about these papers and they, they don't seem to be willing to correct or retract them. So I hope that people who do the work that I do can be paid and protected legally. We are sort of fact checkers, I guess. And I hope fraudsters will receive some punishments. And sometimes we hear about these cases, but very often the junior person is fired while the senior person can keep on frauding. And we've seen several cases of that not in the microbiome field, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, but in some other fields. And, and that's very unfortunate. It seems that there's very, uh, very little consequences for these people. I am worried about artificial intelligence. It's sort of dual use research. It can do good things, but it can also do a lot of bad things. And then finally, there's a tremendous cost of science misconduct, not just for scientists who try to replicate these papers, but for science as a whole, because we have seen in the past two years how much misinformation there is, how uh, you know fewer and fewer people seem to seem to um, be fans of science, and I'm a big fan of science, and I do not want you to walk away from my talk thinking that all science is flawed, that there's no uh, you know no hope for science, because we need science. We need science to deal with pandemics, to deal with um, with all kinds of diseases to deal with um, climate change or pollution. We need science, but we need science to be good. Thank you.